Ah, hi from Kansas. That's pretty cool. People from all over the place. Well, welcome folks. My name is Shiloh Fontes. I've got Lucas Snyder with me and we're here from Flandreau Planetarium. Uh, oh, hi from New Jersey. Good to see you guys. Well, welcome to Homecoming 2020, a little bit differently than we've ever done before. Um, we are so glad to get to join in and as much as we would love to have all of you under our dome, we're really excited to get to walk you through the Tucson sky, perhaps in a, a slightly different way. Um, but hopefully you'll still be able to go outside and check for some constellations and planets in tonight's night sky. Uh, but yeah, we're really excited to have everyone. Of course, now with the virtual Zooms, we can bear down from everywhere. So of course, I'm an actually an alumni from here. So Arizona is near and dear to my heart to see many of you guys in chat. Um, also bear down, so really exciting here. We're gonna go ahead and move our screen over and get to see the night sky. Here we are. So we're just gonna give you guys a brief overview. We're gonna go ahead and start to move the sun. We're gonna set the sun to get just about eight o'clock tonight. Now, if you're at a different um, latitude and longitude than we are here in Tucson, things might be a little bit later or earlier than we're looking at now. But in general, you should hopefully be able to take some of the things that we're looking at tonight and apply them to where you are. So we're gonna move the sky. As you guys can see, we've got our sun setting over here in the west and our nice night sky showing up. Now, if you haven't remembered, we are a dark sky city. So we have a lot of rules and regulations in place to ensure that we've got an amazing night sky here. We get to see visitors from all over the place who come and visit and are just shocked at how many more stars you can see here in Southern Arizona. So it makes it a really good place for telescope viewing. Of course, we have our wonderful telescopes on top of Mount Lemmon. And we're actually still building the mirrors for telescopes, not only here, but all over the world underneath the football stadium with the Richard F. Karras Mirror Lab. So exciting times here. I know that they're gearing up soon to start building more mirrors for the GMT telescope that's gonna be down in Chile. So we're looking forward to seeing when that comes up. But we are almost here to eight o'clock in our nighttime sky view. And I'll go ahead and pause the sky once we get there. And we're going to talk about the path that the sun is moving through the night sky. Or I'm sorry, now it's set. So now we have the moon, everything coming up. There's a line called this ecliptic. Now the ecliptic path is the perceived path of the sun through the sky. So, you know, we watch the sky, uh, sun move and it almost seems like the sun is moving. But in actuality, we are rotating place as we orbit around the sun. So it's just all appearances. But something neat about this ecliptic line is we can see several different things along it, including the planets, because essentially we're one giant interstellar pizza. And so all the planets are going to be along that ecliptic path. We're going to go ahead and make the planets nice and big. I'm actually going to make that ecliptic line go away so we can see them. Now, over here in the southwest, Actually, let's go ahead and change our view so we can get a slightly better view of these planets. All right. Now it's a little distorted because we're used to looking, this up, looking at these on the dome, but hopefully you guys get an idea of what we're looking at here. So in the Southwest, we have two planets nice and bright in the sky. We've got Jupiter and Saturn. They are getting closer and closer to each other every night as we make our way towards the Great Conjunction, which will happen here on December 21st. This will be the closest encounter of the two planets in the night sky since 1623. Now, they're not actually going um, like in space gonna connect. It's just that the alignment of their um, of themselves as they're going around the sun is getting closer and closer. So we're able to see them be almost become like one. So from here, it'll look like a single star, but we're actually able to, with telescopes, still just barely tell them apart. So really exciting. Uh, December 21st, mark your calendars, definitely go outside and take a look at those. Now, if you don't know, space is indeed wildcat country. So even though these planets are fairly far away from us, we have a lot to do with them. Uh, with Jupiter, 
Uh, we have the Juno mission, which is a spacecraft that is uh, currently at Jupiter, learning to study the water potentially in the atmosphere. And that's being run by um, our on that team is William Hubbard, who is part of Lunar and Planetary Labs here at the U of A. And of course, Saturn. Saturn is very near and dear to my heart. I love that planet. Oh, the conjunction is going to be December 21st. Um, but Saturn, actually the U of A built many of the instruments and the camera systems that were on the Cassini spacecraft. Um, so thanks to that, we have so many beautiful images of that planet. And it's been fascinating to watch even as they still process um, some of those imageries. Now, as we continue to move and look through our sky, if we head towards the south, you will see one very bright red dot, but it will not be a star, it will be a planet. Now, how can we tell if we're looking at a planet or if we're looking at a star? Um, many of you might recall the nursery rhyme, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Um, might sound funny, but it's actually true. Stars twinkle and planets do not. Uh, the light that's traveling from a star is coming from a very far distance. It's got to go through interstellar dust and gas, and then it has to go through our atmosphere. So we kind of get this twinkling effect. Now, planets are reflecting the light from the sun, uh, or rather the sun is illuminating them, so we're able to see them. But because that light doesn't trans tra travel as far, we don't really get that same twinkling effect. Now, Mars, of course, its population is robots, uh, but most of them are actually U of A robots. Uh, so the U of A is part of the six active Mars missions right now, including monitoring the locations of where the InSight lander is going to be heading. So we're utilizing the high-rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to look at the places where we want InSight to land. Uh, by we, I mean NASA in that aspect. Um, because Mars tends to have a lot of dust storms, we want to make sure that wherever this uh, spacecraft is, or I'm sorry, this rover is going to land is going to be safe. So we're utilizing our great cameras and are able to go ahead and, and watch that Martian surface. If you have not looked at the high-rise images recently, I believe it's just highrise.arizona.edu, definitely check it out. They are constantly putting out amazing images of the Martian surface. So 100%, 10 out of 10 would recommend, go check that out. Now, as we continue to move through the sky, I believe that's gonna be all of our planets. Um, actually, I did lie, apologies. We do have every third grader's favorite planet out here, Uranus, but it, unfortunately it is too far for us to see with a naked eye. Although my planetarium director says he's seen it in an incredibly dark area. Um, I've heard that from a few people. If you get to go somewhere where there's like no light pollution whatsoever, you can basically see a tiny dot that doesn't twinkle. Um, much better chances with a telescope though. Um, so those are gonna be our four planets that are out tonight. And if I bring that ecliptic line back up, you can see how they all pass through it. Again, that concept of a interstellar pizza dish, everything is in one plane. Um, it's part of the rules for being a planet kind of orbiting around in that same area. But something else we're gonna find along that ecliptic path are going to be the zodiacal constellations or the zodiac constellations. They all pass through this ecliptic plane and ancient times used to use the different constellations as a method of calendaring. Um, would tell them when to uh, when to plant uh, crops, when to harvest crops, when the seasons would be changing, different celebrations. Um, so that's how that kind of came into play. And they're all based on Roman um, mythologies. Okay, so we've just got one setting right now, and it's going to be our first one here. This is gonna be Sagittarius the Archer. Now, even though it's setting, I do want to bring it up because something's really exciting about Sagittarius. Now, just in this general area, you might see this kind of cloudy um, cloud <laughs> starting to appear. And this is actually the Milky Way. Um, 
from here, you can see the Milky Way during Milky Way season, which ironically tends to fall um, before Halloween. Uh, maybe that's why we plan candy for that time of the year. But if you get to go somewhere else where it's really nice and dark, um, earlier in the summer to just about late fall, you got, you'll get to see it. Now, the beauty of the Milky Way, as you can see here, is that there are hundreds upon thousands of stars in there. And the reason I bring it up with Sagittarius is towards that center is going to be Sagittarius A star. And that is the supermassive black hole that is that we believe everything in our Milky Way is orbiting around. Now, super exciting if you didn't know, the first picture of a black hole was taken by University of Arizona team that's part of the Event Horizon Telescope team. And uh, Demetrius Pisaltis, uh, uh, Farrell Ozell and Dan Moroni are just a few of the members on that team and they were able to take the image of M87. So our first picture of a black hole, um, which is exciting because it's going to help us basically prove Einstein's theory of relativity. And as in its name, it has been still a theory, even though it's widely accepted. And hopefully soon they'll begin working to take a picture towards the center of our Milky Way. It's a really complicated process though. They have to use several telescopes all at the same time aimed at one place. So it's definitely not easy, um, but it's very exciting um, as, as we continue on with that. So as I keep mentioning, space truly is wildcat country from the close planets to the far black holes of other galaxies. Now, our next constellation right above Sagittarius is going to be Capricornus. Now, Capricornus is supposed to be a sea goat, uh, but I sort of feel like it's more of a cat shape. Got little cat ears here and a cat nose. Um, that's sort of the beauty also of the constellations. If you have little mnemonics or other descriptions that help you continue to find the constellations, I definitely always suggest those. Um, whatever helps you learn the night sky. Now, um, petting our space cat, just above to the south here is going to be Aquarius, the water bearer. All right. And as we continue to go ahead and move our camera, we're going to look further to the south. Our next constellation is going to be Pisces, the fish. Now, Pisces has a few unique features, um, including uh, what's called a circlet. So if you guys can follow my mouse here, if you're looking towards the southeast, um, almost about 45 uh, degrees off of the horizon, you're gonna see this little hexagonal shape here of stars. This is what's called one of the circlets in Pisces the fish. There we go. And we'll continue to go a little bit more towards the southeast. Now, if you've noticed so far, all of these constellations have passed through the ecliptic line, but our next constellations of Aries the Ram does not. Now, the lines that you're seeing that we're bringing up are the traditional lines, um, but there are different uh, constellation lines um, in different areas. What we're most looking at when we come to calling this Aries and passing through that ecliptic is that there may have been more stars in this constellation many, many years ago, uh, but those stars have now gone faint. But we also have what are called constellation boundaries, and those are a lot larger than the constellation lines themselves. So it's kind of this region here that's going to be our constellations. Now, last but not least, coming up in the eastern horizon now, we're going to see a really bright, bright red star. Um, pretty low to the horizon. That's probably about 15, 10, 15 degrees off the horizon. Uh, five, Lucas? Okay, somewhere in there. I'm a, a little bad with degrees. <laughs> um, but this is actually a star called Aldebaran, and this is a giant red star. Uh, and it's actually here in what's called the Hyades, but it's going to also be in the head of Taurus the bull. Something else that's neat about uh, Taurus is right above his shoulder, if you can see this little tiny cluster of stars. This is called the Pleiades, or also known as the Seven Sisters. 
Now, from here, we can see approximately seven stars, and ancient Romans used to use this as a vision test for its soldiers. Um, I say take that with a grain of salt, though, as I have astigmatism, you can see with my glasses, and I can see all seven stars without my glasses, but it's really neat. This is a nursery of newborn stars, so when we get the chance to look at it through a telescope, we do see a little bit of a blue tinge. Um, in space, the kind of color temperatures are reversed. Uh, blue is actually much hotter than red. All right, I do see a question here. Can we see Bennu the asteroid? Um, if we have time at the end of the talk, I can try and get us up there, but from Earth, we can't see Bennu. Um, it's much too small for us to see with the naked eye. Um, and distance wise, um, Lucas, is it on the other side of the solar system right now? Yeah, it's on the other side of the solar system. So um, unfortunately, we it, it's really hard to see it. Um, but we are really excited that OSIRIS-REx team was successful in poking the asteroid. I was like, they call it tag, let's tag an asteroid, um, which is a fun, fun word for it. And I'm glad they were able to get a sample and can't wait for it to come back because the science that's going to come off of OSIRIS-REx is going to be amazing, especially as we look at what um, the building blocks of our solar system, like how did this all begin? Um, so really exciting there. All right, we have one more constellation that I'm gonna look at here in the south um, before I change our camera view. And it's back right here under Pisces. Now coming up is going to be Cetus the sea monster. You can see him here. Now this is supposed to be like a fin, and the scary monster head. Some drawings have this is the scary monster head and this is the body, but we can use our imaginations a little bit for that. All right, now I am gonna zoom back out. I wanna highlight something here. Now, as we're looking at our constellations, we're gonna split our sky into three seasons. Uh, we have our fall constellations over here, basically in the Southwest that are now setting. We have our I'm sorry, our summer constellations. We have our fall constellations are gonna be here in the center, nice and high. And we have now our winter constellations beginning to come up. So if you were to stay up almost all night long, you could essentially see most of the constellations that we have um, as far as seasonally. Now there are 88 total constellations, but I believe in the Northern hemisphere, we only see 44, Lucas? Yes, 44. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and go back to the view we were in. Zoom back into space. You guys can see the edge of the Catalina Mountains there along the bottom of our screen. Then let's go back towards Taurus. Now, as I mentioned, we do have some of our winter constellations coming up. So above the Catalinas, if you're back here in Tucson, or if you're looking towards your northeast, a little bit closer to the east, you're going to see a very bright star in the night sky. This star's name is Capella, and it is part of the constellation of Auriga the Charioteer. Now, this is definitely a winter constellation. Capella is even part of the winter hexagon or the winter diamond or as I like to call it, the winter Pac-Man. Um, so as the night continues, we'll get to see more and more of those winter constellations. Uh, Capella is also known as the goat star. Um, and the little stars here to the right, these little three stars, those are known as the kid stars or the baby goats. Uh, Capella and Auriga are actually in the night sky as Capella was a chariot racer and he had a very good relationship with his goats because they helped him win. And it was um, ancient, uh, uh, the word I want to use, um, tradition, that word just left me there for a second, uh, to sacrifice an animal before your races for good luck. And Origo was appalled and actually put his goat uh, that was supposed to be slated for sacrifice in his chariot with him. And of course he won the race. So it's one of the 
one of the myths behind the constellations and one of the reasons that he's in the night sky. All right. And I see a few raised hands. If you guys have questions, please feel free to pop them in the uh, question and answer box. Um, Lucas will read them if they're uh, where we're at right now, or he'll bring them up as we get towards that area. All right. Okay, I do see a question. If these are winter, why is the line labeled with the sun term, with summer months? Ah, good question. So, a uh, question was asked about why the months here are being labeled with summer months, even though technically Taurus is a winter constellation. Um, these are opposite of where they are in the sky. So, um, during the middle of the day right now, the sun is sitting, if we could see the ecliptic and if we could see the month labels, it would be sitting in November. So typically we're seeing what's on the opposite side. Um, I hope that makes sense. Lucas, is that a, you have a better way to explain that? Okay. I hope that made sense, Tara. Let, me, let us know if that, if that didn't make sense. Okay, so we're going to continue to move through our sky. We're going to head towards the north. Now, as we get later into the winter months, uh, it becomes a little bit harder for us to find the North Star. The North Star is not the brightest star in the sky. Actually, it's quite far down the bright star list. Um, and so normally during the summer and spring months, we can use the uh, asterism of the Big Dipper to find it. Um, but around now, our Big Dipper is getting very low in the sky. So we can actually use the constellation of Cassiopeia the Queen to help find it. Now, if you're looking towards the north, we're going to come again about 45 degrees off of the horizon to kind of look for a three shape here in the sky. And that's going to give us Cassiopeia. Now, Cassiopeia, if you could imagine, again with the Pac-Man, I'm a child of the 80s. Uh, if you can imagine her Pac-Manning across the sky, she's actually going to waka waka towards the North Star. Go ahead and bring the line up so you can see that. So if you can't find the Big Dipper, you can use Cassiopeia in order to help you find that North Star. Now, the North Star is actually gonna be in the handle of the Little Dipper, and that is another asterism. So that's twice now at that. So what is an asterism? So we're used to all of the constellations, as we can see. Asterisms are smaller parts of those constellations or parts of several constellations that help us find other constellations. A lot of constellations in there. But basically, it's a kind of a shortcut in order to help us find them. So the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper are not constellations, but they are asterisms. So once we find that North Star, we're going to go ahead and have the handle to the Little Dipper. Here we are. And I'll show you where the Big Dipper is. That way you can see how low it's reaching to the horizon. I believe at this point it might be almost fully. Yeah. So yes, our Big Dipper is pretty much below the horizon. Although if we look at the constellation of Ursa Major, uh, we might actually be able to see a little bit of that. So let's go ahead, bring him up. There we go. There is our bear directly to our north, just peeking up over the horizon. Now, like, this is a fairly large constellation. If you get a chance to look at it during other seasons, it's it's pretty large. Although I'm not sure why they created an asterism for the Little Dipper, because all we're gonna do here is close the lid on the box and we're gonna get the constellation of Ursa Minor. So kind of strange, but. Now, if you've ever seen those cool astrophotography pictures of all the stars moving around one central point, the photographer was focused on the North Star. And that's because everything will move around that. And that's our pull point. So if you could stick an imaginary stick through the Earth, that's where we're pointing because we're actually tilted about 23 and a half degrees. Um, so we don't rotate 
directly up and down as we move around the sun and we are angled. And that's why we get the seasons as well, because that changes how much sunlight is directly hitting us during different seasons. So hence winter to summer. Now let's head back up to Cassiopeia here. Oh, quick question. Uh, what's the difference between <laughs> the difference between a constellation and an asterism? Ah, it's okay. So the difference between a constellation and an asterism. So asterisms are going to be parts of constellations that are easier to recognize or find, or there are going to be several bits of constellations, or I'm sorry, um, stars that are parts of several different constellations that help us find a grouping. Uh, we'll actually see an example of that second um, explanation here in just a minute as we make towards the sky. Um, there are several cons um, asterisms that we use in the night sky, and they really just help us find these bigger constellations. Um, not all of the stars in many of the constellations are super bright, even when you get a chance to go where it's really dark. So these asterisms can be really handy in helping us find those constellations. All right, I hope that, hope that answered that. All right, so we have Queen Cassiopeia. With her, we're going to have her husband, King Cephas. Now, Cephas looks like a house with feet. I always laugh and say he's running away from Cassiopeia because she causes him a lot of trouble. Their daughter is also in the night sky. That's going to be Andromeda. Now Andromeda is just to the east of Cassiopeia, coming up towards our top bar screen here. If you are again are somewhere where it's nice and dark, you're actually able to see a smudge in the sky. And it's just over here, if you imagine, um, this is a stick figure, uh, if this is her left side, there's a smudge where her left hand would be. Um, that's actually gonna be the Andromeda galaxy. And it is our closest galaxial neighbor at 2.5 million light years away. So, you know, just to skip down the street, but it's actually really cool because it's the only one we can see with our naked eye. It's pretty neat. Now, Right below Andromeda is going to be Perseus the hero. Um, we can find him by using the Pleiades. It helps us find by imagining if he was stepping on the Pleiades almost or leaping up off the Pleiades. So that's going to give us his foot just to the north of those and help his body and he's reaching for the princess. And that's going to be Perseus the hero. Now I'm going to go ahead and zoom out so we can see the rest of the characters in this story. Here we are, back to reorient us with Cassiopeia, Cephas, Perseus, and Andromeda. And connected to Andromeda is going to be what's called uh, another asterism. This is the Great Square, um, but it's going to give us the rest of the constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse. Now, if you have ever heard the story of Snow White, uh, Queen Cassiopeia is much like that evil queen. She's very vain, so vain that she spread the word everywhere that she was the most beautiful in the land. Now, Poseidon, who in mythology, who is the god of the sea, didn't appreciate that. He believed that his sea nymphs were the most beautiful. And he sent his sea monster, Cetus, whom we met earlier, to destroy her town. Um, Cassiopeia uh, uh, understandably panicked uh, and then went to Zeus to see what she could do um, but Zeus couldn't stop Poseidon so he said well maybe you should offer a sacrifice so you can hear from mythology lots of sacrifices happened um, so poor Andromeda gets offered up as a snack to Cetus basically uh, but fortunately for her Perseus was on his way from slaying the, um, the Gorgon Medusa and was able to rescue uh, Andromeda by showing the head of the Gorgon to Cetus and turning him to stone. Now, many of the um, constellation figures in the sky, it's, uh, it's considered to be a privilege or an honor to be in the night sky. But for, Androm or for Cassiopeia, it's sort of a punishment because during different parts of the night, she's upside down. And that was sort of meant to be um, a in, in due to her vanity, like as a reminder not to be too vain. Now, a neat thing about Perseus is actually going to be over here, this one little bright star. Um, so if you were never looking for the Pleiades, 
coming on up. It's going to be the next brightest star in Perseus. This is Algol, and this is actually known as the Demon Star. And it's often depicted in old mythological pictures as the head of the Gorgon. So, mythology. Weird, right? All right. So we're going to go ahead and look at a few more constellations just in this area, and then we'll begin to make our way towards um, what are we're now setting our summer constellations. So let's go ahead and adjust our view again. All right. Now, snaking between the two bears is going to be Draco the dragon. And an easy way to go ahead and look for Draco. Oh, we can move our screen here. Wrong way. Okay. So we're looking pretty much directly north. We can go ahead and look between the two bears and we're gonna find a, not a square for sure, um, parallelogram? Quadrilateral. Quadrilateral, there we go. <laughs> this is gonna be the head of Draco the dragon. Now, Draco is going to lead us to our next constellation of Hercules. And that's because Hercules actually defeated uh, Draco. Um, this is, Draco is supposed to be reminiscent of the snake that was guarding the golden apples in the Garden of Hesperides. And so one of Hercules' tasks was to uh, get one of these golden apples. So if we go ahead and look towards our sky, Drake, uh, Hercules is going to be in this area. We'll bring his constellation lines up. Here we are, Hercules. I don't know about you, but every time I look at Hercules, I get the, uh, if you've seen the Disney movie, um, Hercules, Hercules, it just jumps in my head every time I hear it. All right. Now we're gonna go ahead and look towards the center of our screen right here. Now, as I mentioned with Taurus, we were looking at our winter, winter constellations. But right here in the center, we're gonna have our summer constellations still. Now, this is going to be another asterism, and this asterism is made up of three stars from three different constellations. So again, not necessarily using constellations for this one, but we're using the stars of those constellations. And this is going to be the Summer Triangle. Now, even though the Summer Triangle comes up early... <laughs> oh. I mean, there is the Eddie Murphy Hercules indeed, but I, I, I just love the Disney one. I know that's silly, but it, you know, it just stuck with me. <laughs> okay, so our summer triangle actually rises fairly early in the year. And as you can see here in November, we're still seeing it. It is made up of three different stars, including Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Now, Vega, I'm sorry, Vega, I've got myself reversed here in the night sky is going to be part of the constellation of Lyra the Harp. Wow, I really had myself backwards in the sky. All right. Something neat about Lyra though, Ly um, I'm sorry, Vega. Vega is the fifth brightest star in the night sky. And if you remember, I mentioned that the earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees. That means that the earth actually has a little bit of a wobble and thankfully the moon keeps us stable. Um, but it means that every uh, 2,000 to 3,000 years, we actually see a new North Star. And uh, back, I believe it was 13,560 years ago, Vega used to be our North Star. Um, and another 13,000 years, Vega will be our North Star again. So mark your calendars so you can check out for our new North Star. Um, we are pretty fortunate though right now because in the general area, there are no other very bright stars. So we have a pretty good North Star right now. Now crossing through the Milky Way with Deneb is gonna be Cygnus the Swan. Now I mentioned one black hole earlier, but another one exists in Cygnus. It's near the star that's called Cygnus X1 which is a binary star system, which means there are two stars. And one of those stars has collapsed and it is a black hole. And we're actually observing um, as the other star moves around it, which is very interesting because we kind of assumed at, 
One of the theories at first was that black holes just pulled everything apart. Um, but some black holes can be at equilibrium with the objects around it. And so that's another example where we kind of see that happening. And last but not least, over here in our west, we have Altair with Aquila the Eagle. So that brings us basically all the way back to all of our constellations where we started here with Hercules. Now, if I zoom back out, as you can see, that's not all, there's a lot of empty space. And this is what you can primarily see in the night sky. Um, these are the brighter constellations, but as I mentioned, there are a lot more constellations. I'm gonna go ahead and turn them all on. And there's actually pictures behind these. So some of the mythology I was mentioning, I swear I'm not totally crazy, but they are all based in mythology. You can see some of the figures that go with all of those constellations. Um, for the most part, everything is rooted in um, ancient mythology. There's about six or 10 constellations that are more recent. Um, I kind of feel like the more recent ones got less creative with their names. There's one that's called Triangulum and Telescopium, and they are exactly as they sound, a telescope and a measuring triangle. So, uh, no, ancient ones were a lot more interesting. Okay. Let's see, do we have any questions so far? I've kind of answered most of them as we're going through. I know I have a few more minutes here. Okay, so from this view, Southern Hemisphere stars are named for animals. Lucas. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of- Go ahead. A lot of uh, animal constellations in the Southern Hemisphere, but also a lot of those kind of uh, the boring ones that Shiloh talked about, the technology ones. We have a, when we had an operator who was just learning how to use our system, um, absolutely love to highlight every single one of, of those newer constellations. Uh, Telescopium and Triangulum were some of his favorite. Um, but yeah, there you go. All right, so what I'm gonna do for our last bit here, if you've got more questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the q and A. I'm gonna go ahead and leave us off of Earth. So we're gonna bounce off our Earth here. As you can see, we're starting to see some other constellations that we didn't get to see. Again, those being a lot in the north, or I'm sorry, in the southern hemisphere. There is our Earth. Now we're looking at the daylight side. We can wave to Australia. And we're just gonna go ahead and zoom out because I have a question. Let's see if um, I can do a poll question. Let's see if this, oh. That may not be as easy as I thought. Okay, so something for you to think about as we're zooming out. From Earth, we have used all of these constellations and we've connected the dots for many of them. That's why we have all these figures. But do you think that the constellations work outside of our uh, solar system? Now, I'm gonna give you a second to think about that. And think that you if you think that they do work okay if you think they don't work okay okay so now let's go ahead and zoom outside of our solar system and this is where we can really see how far apart everything is in space these constellation lines that we've created are connecting stars that are hundreds some even thousands of miles apart and now we can see a little spiky ball of stars right there. And that is just gonna show us where we live in our Milky Way. There is our beautiful spiral galaxies. We move around our supermassive black hole there in the center. And as I mentioned earlier, it is exciting times as the U of A continues to work on all sorts of projects NASA projects, telescope, research to help us really define what lies beyond the edge of our solar system and beyond. 
So you should be proud of your alma mater for sure, because space truly is wildcat country. All right, folks. Well, I'm going to leave it here for a second. See, oh, there's no question. Well, there's no stars outside the Milky Way. Actually, there are stars outside the Milky Way. They're in other galaxies. Um, so this is a very weird concept. And even I still have a, a hard time wrapping my mind around it. And Lucas actually probably has a better concept because this is where a lot of his master's research is. So as you can see, these other colored dots now on our screen, these are no longer stars. These are all the other galaxies that we've found. And what's really interesting about this is there's a lot of space in between them, a lot of space and space. And so we're trying to figure out what really makes those empty spaces in between the galaxies and what causes everything to move and expand outward the way it does. Um, and as you can see, if we continue to go further, there's a lot of stuff out there, <laughs> but we are still missing a big part of the picture. Even with our most advanced telescopes and technology, we're really only able to see above and below the Milky Way. Um, as far as I understand, the Milky Way's arms are so thick with interstellar dust and gas that it makes it very difficult to see out the sides. So as you can see here, there's we're missing a big part of the picture. Uh, question, how many stars are in the Milky Way? Ooh, uh, Lucas, do you know that? <laughs> uh, there's uh, around a couple hundred billion stars. A couple hundred billion stars, that is that's a lot of stars. Oh, and uh, a question from earlier about Bennu. Are you able to show us that? Oh, yeah. Let's go ahead and take a look at our friend Bennu here. So let's try and adjust our trajectory. We're going to head back in towards our solar system. Now, we'll admit this is not a more recent model of Bennu. Um, I know that they were incredibly surprised when they reached Bennu because it was a lot more rocky than anticipated, but that team made adjustments as needed and they were able to work on the fly to figure out the best way to get a sample from the asteroid. So, I mean, saying that there are incredibly smart and talented people on that team would be an understatement, so. But here we are as we get closer and closer. There is Bennu. Now, Bennu is a near Earth asteroid. So that means it orbits um, within the orbit path of Earth as it goes around the sun. Um, it, at one point, and I don't know if it still is, was classified as a potentially hazardous asteroid because it did have a chance of um, hitting the Earth. And I believe it was 20. 235 something like that um but they've made adjustments on that ever since they've gotten uh, gotten closer to it and be able to study its its uh, orbit path a lot better but that is Bennu and Bennu um is quite large uh, 500 kilometers across um so decently sized asteroid um and uh yeah all right how many planets in the Milky Way? Oh, Paul, you've got some great questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start that and I'm going to let Lucas take it over. Because um, I know that we're still finding planets constantly. So as we look for what's called extrasolar planets or the exoplanets, um, we're, we're constantly discovering new ones. And the way that we're discovering them, a lot of them is just from observations. Now, there are new telescopes out there, like TESS, which is now um, one of the telescopes that's out in space, much like Hubble, um, that are specifically looking for exoplanets. So we're constantly finding new ones. But I don't know if there's a rough estimate, Lucas? Uh, yeah, we've, we've found a few thousand so far, but uh, they think it's possible there could be even more planets than stars. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, lot to, a lot to find. That's crazy. It's a lot of planets. I want to know who comes up with names for all of them. I feel like that would be interesting. Like, have you ever thought of the person who gets to name paint, like paint names? I feel like that's really cool. Like planet names, I'm going to name planets after a whole bunch of different things. 
Sorry, I digress. <laughs> All right, folks, um, again, I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate getting to, uh, quote unquote, see everyone and having you guys join. This has been super exciting. Again, bear down from everywhere. You can join in from uh, live and virtual, and we can't wait to see you guys back on our campus at some point. And oh, I got one more question. Are we alone? You know, I'm going to take my personal opinion. I don't think so, but you know, there's so much out there. How could we how could we know? And as we learn how to observe better, we're beginning to learn to look at other planets and think and see what signatures we're looking at when we're looking for the potential for life. So that's a I mean, I feel like there's too many possibilities to say no, but who knows? But all right, guys. Again, thank you. I'm so glad you some of you were joining from far and near. Again, we can't wait to see you guys all again. And thank you so much. We hope you have a great evening and bear down.